guys, what's up? And welcome back to my channel. So today we're gonna be talking about Chad Daybell because an affidavit has been released where we have more information as to what happened to Lori Vallow's children, JJ and Tylee. Just to be clear, in the affidavit, I will have highlighted sections because there are some parts that I've already discussed in prior videos, which will be linked down below, but I will also give you a link to the full 11 pages of the document, though we're pretty much gonna go over all of them, just skipping certain sections. This might be a long one. Okay, so this is page one of the affidavit. The only reason I'm showing you this is because there's a person in the affidavit who refers to as I. That I is Detective Ron. Ball and he's been with the Rexburg Police Department law enforcement for more than 27 years. So just to give you context on who is talking about this. So on page two, there's a lot of reiteration of the basic facts of this case, which we already know. I'm just gonna underline here the timing because the timing is extremely important. Since November 26, 2019, the Rexburg Police Department, along with the FBI, have been investigating the location and whereabouts of these two minor children. The last verifiable sighting of Tylee Ryan was on September 8th, 2019 in Yellowstone National Park. The last verifiable sighting of JJ Vallow was September 22nd, 2019 in his mother's apartment. Lori Vallow moved to Rexburg on or about September 1st, 2019 with her children, Tylee, Ryan, and JJ Vallow and her brother, Alex Cox. Alex Cox resided in the same complex, initially living in the same unit as Lori and then moving into his own unit. So I'm gonna pause here. This is important because Alex Cox, who is now deceased, allegedly due to natural causes, which Okay. Alex Cox ends up being a very big part of all of this, so him living close to Lori is very important and a key point to remember. Lori Vallow's close friend, Melanie Gibb, has cooperated with Idaho and Arizona law enforcement regarding the investigation of the children. Melanie Gibb has reported that from September 19th, 2019 through the morning of September 23rd, 2019, she visited Lori Vallow at her new residence in Rexburg, Idaho. Lori Vallow informed her that Jay J.J. Vallow had become a zombie. Give further reports that the term zombie refers to an individual whose mortal spirit has left their body and that their body is now the host of another spirit. The spirit in a zombie is always considered a quote unquote dark spirit. While the dark spirit inhabits the host body, the person's true spirit goes into limbo and it is stuck there until the host body is physically killed. As such, death of the physical body is seen as the mechanism by which the body's original spirit can be released from limbo. This belief was told to Gibb by Lori Vallow. Lori Vallow had learned it from Chad Daybell and immediately told Gibb. Gibb was present with Lori Vallow when Chad Daybell first taught Lori this information on the phone in early 2019 in reference to Charles Vallow. Charles Vallow is also dead and was shot by Alex Cox, okay? So everything here is deeply, deeply connected and I just don't want that to be forgotten. Melanie Gibb has further informed me that Lori Vallow called Tylee a zombie in the spring of 2019. Gibb was on the phone with Lori and heard Lori call Tylee a zombie to which Tylee responded, not me, mom. This arose out of Lori requiring Tylee to babysit JJ and Tylee did not want to. Lori Vallow also told Gibb that Tylee had turned into a zombie when she was 12 or 13, which was approximately the same time Tylee had become quote unquote, difficult to deal with. So just a quick note, the rest of page four are things that we've already discussed. However, it is very suspicious to me, like everything in this case, that the qualification for being a zombie is essentially acting up if you count a teenager saying, I don't want to babysit my little brother, even acting up. It's interesting to me that that was like the, ter the determination made for her being a zombie. And of course there are things that happen behind closed doors, but considering that this whole theory of being a zombie is ridiculous, it wouldn't surprise me if it just came out of Tylee not wanting to babysit her little brother, which is not an atypical thing for a teenager to not want to do. So putting on such a heavy label for such a non-issue is to me, a way to scapegoat, you know? Because if there's nothing really wrong with your children, but you want it there to be, you can always find a reason why they're zombies and why they're negative spirits, right? The cellular analysis survey team here and after CAST or CAST 
is an FBI unit that provides analyses of cell phone records and presents the information to law enforcement. CAST has analyzed Alex Cox's phone and provided the location information mentioned in paragraph 13. The CAST analysis provides the location of Cox's phone. The location of Cox's phone ends up being massively important, so it might be a little bit confusing, but I've created like a little chart to contextualize things. So on Monday, September 9th, which is one day after Tylee was last seen, Midnight to 44 past midnight, Cox's phone was located at his apartment. However, from 2.42 a.m. to 3.37 a.m., Cox is located again at Lori's apartment, where Lori lived with Tylee and JJ. This is significant not only because he's there in the middle of the night, but also because this is the only time in September he appears to go over to Lori's between midnight and 6 a.m. At 4.37 a.m., Alex went back to his own apartment until 8.59 a.m. At 9.21 a.m., he was located at a property with the address so-and-so, which is the residence of Chad Daybell. The 921 reading is a GPS data point and places him behind the home on Daybell's property near the east end of the barn. Alex Cox's phone was still at the Daybell residence at 10.39. At 10.57 to 11.39, Cox is located at the Daybell property. At 11.52 to 12.02, he was at Del Taco in Rexburg. Now there's one important thing to note here. At 10.47, it shows that, that he hit the city of St. Anthony, but the thing is the city of St. Anthony is a five minute drive from Daybell's residence, so many are making the assumption that he never left Daybell's residence and that it just pinged elsewhere. So then, on June 1st, 2020, I was informed by Special Agent Ricky Wright of the FBI that the FBI had been examining a phone believed to be owned by Tamara Tammy Daybell. Tammy was Chad's wife and died on October 19th, 2019. The FBI found a text conversation between Tammy and her husband, Chad Daybell, on September 9th, 2019, which is the day after the last known sighting of Tylee Ryan in the Yellowstone National Park. So the text conversation went as follows. Chad to Tammy at 11.53 a.m. Well, I've had an interesting morning. I felt I should burn all of the limb debris by the fire pit before it got too soaked by the coming storms. While I did so, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun, and he was still walking along. I got close enough that one shot did the trick. He is now in our pet cemetery. Fun times. So I wanna pause here a second because I know that it might seem a little confusing. So here's a little graphic thingy I made just to kind of contextualize what happened. Tylee Ryan last seen on September 8th. Alex Cox was at Lori Vallow's home in the middle of the night of September 9th. In the morning of September 9th, he was on Chad's property near the east end of the barn. And like I said, due to the tower ping, he could have left, but the minimum time he spent on the property that's confirmed was from 921 to 1047. If the ping was incorrect, then he was actually there until 1139. So he never left. It was just consecutive from 921 to 1139. This same day, Chad Daybell claimed to have shot a raccoon and texted Tammy Daybell, his wife, to let her know he'd also been burning debris and burying the raccoon. So as you can see, all of these things put together don't seem like minor coincidences. Why was it that day that he decided he was gonna burn the debris? Also, texting his wife shortly after Alex Cox left. Also, the way he brought up the raccoon thing seemed really weird to say it's interesting and like, fun to bury an animal in this pet cemetery. Everything here seems weird, but I definitely think that Telling his wife about the non-existent raccoon, obviously that's made up in my mind anyway, was a paper trail, right? Because now anyone who says, oh, I heard a gunshot, there's like that paper trail. And in fact, the neighbors will also come into this because they end up asking about hearing the gunshot, okay? So hopefully everything makes sense until now. So then I found the text messages suspicious because raccoons are normally nocturnal animals and are not regularly out during the day. It should be noted that from interviewing neighbors of Chad Daybell, we are aware that in mid-July of 2019, Garth Daybell, Chad's son, told their neighbors that Chad had shot a raccoon out of a tree on their property during the day. Those neighbors are named Matt and Regan Price. Garth told Matt Price about the raccoon in a response to a question from Matt about hearing a gunshot. The Prices informed me that the fire pit in the back of the Daybell property was hardly ever used until the last few months. Regan informed me that there appeared to be frequent bonfires in the pit on the Daybell property over the last few months, and the first one she noticed was soon after Tammy's death on October 19th, 2019. On June 2nd, 2020, Detective Bruce Mattingly of the Free 
Fremont County Sheriff Office contacted Samantha Williams, who is the sister of Tammy Daybell. He asked her if she was aware of a pet cemetery on Chad and Tammy Daybell's property in Idaho. When asked the location of the pet cemetery on the Daybell property, she stated that it was east of the Red Barn near the fire pit. Samantha was then shown an aerial photograph of the Daybell property and she pointed to the same area near the fire pit where Alex Cox's phone pinged on September 9th. So they had a pet cemetery because apparently they were pet lovers and that's just where their pets were buried. The interesting thing is that that is exactly where Cox's phone pinged, indicating that that is where Tylee was for at least a certain amount of time if, if she's not dispersed elsewhere. Also, as you see, the raccoon paper trail was important because the neighbors did end up asking what that was. The fact that he, the fires only started being burned after the death of Tammy Daybell is also significant in my opinion, but let's keep going. The above facts establish that Alex Cox appeared to be at the Daybell property on September 9th, 2019, at least until 1139. Chad sent the text to Tammy about burning debris and shooting and burying the raccoon in the pet cemetery only 14 minutes later at 1153. The pet cemetery referenced by Chad Daybell is located at the same location as most of the pings on Alex Cox's phone on September 9th, 2019. On June 3rd, 2020, I interviewed Melanie Gibb and her boyfriend, David Warwick, in Pleasant Grove, Utah. We discussed in depth the weekend of September 22nd and 23rd, 2019, due to the fact that both Gibb and Warwick stayed at Lori Vallow's residence in Rexburg that weekend. Gibb informed me that she arrived in Rexburg on September 19th, 2019. Soon after she arrived, Lori Vallow informed Gibb that JJ had become a zombie and pointed out behaviors such as sitting still and watching TV, claiming JJ said he loved Satan, and an increased vocabulary as evidence that JJ was now a zombie. Gibb observed JJ's behavior and felt it to be the same as she had always observed it. The last time Gibb and Warwick verifiably saw JJ was the night of September 22nd, 2019. Warwick informed us that it was late and that Gibb, Vallow, and Warwick were going to do a podcast. Warwick said that JJ acted up and so Alex Cox took JJ to his apartment in the complex. When Alex returned later that night, he was carrying JJ who appeared to be asleep with his head on Alex's shoulder. Warwick further informed us that when he woke up in the morning of September 23rd, 2019, he asked Lori where JJ was. This was between 8 and 9 a.m. Lori informed Warwick and Gibb that JJ had been acting like a zombie and had been crawling on the kitchen cabinetry and had gotten in on top of the cabinetry in the space between the cabinetry and the ceiling. She informed Warwick and Gibb that when JJ climbed upon the cabinetry that he had knocked a picture of Jesus off the refrigerator. Vallow then informed Warwick and Gibb that Alex had come and taken JJ. The FBI cast team had analyzed Alex Cox's movements on the morning of September 23rd, 2019 by his cell phone GPS. At 9.55, Alex is again on Chad Daybell's property. He was there until 10.12. The pings on his phone locate Alex near the pond on Chad's property at the northern edge of his property. So let's pause here a second and go back to my little diagram. JJ's, I think, is more direct because, again, similarly to Tylee, so again, one day after he's last seen, Alex Cox just happens to be on Chad Daybell's property. On September 23rd, Warwick and Gibb ask where JJ is. Valo says that he's with Cox due to misbehaving, which we'll get to that. And then at 9.55 the same morning, Alex Cox's phone pinged at Daybell's property and he was there until, until 10.12. And then later on a search warrant will prove that that's where his body is, okay? Just so we're clear. So the whole zombie talk again is ridiculous and difficult to believe and like I said, a scapegoat, but the whole premise that he, that JJ said that he loved Satan, first of all, sounds like a lie to me, but also the fact that he'd been climbing up on the cabinets and he specifically got to the refrigerator and knocked off a picture of Jesus and that's what essentially made Vallo pass her son off to Alex Cox again. What I do wanna say, and this is just speculation, I could be entirely wrong, but in paragraph 25, it says, when Alex returned that night, he was carrying JJ who appeared to be asleep with his head on Alex's shoulder. To me, that could even imply that JJ was already dead. I don't know if that's true. I'm just saying in the other situation with Tylee, there was a gunshot here. Maybe the methodology of the murder was different, but I just thought it's interesting that the last time he was seen, he was asleep as far as they knew. This is also an important thing to note because here we have two instances where Cox is 
on Chad Daybell's property right after the kids are last seen. So it says, on June 3rd, 2020, I asked Special Agent Ricky Wright of the FBI to analyze the frequency of Alex Cox's visits to Chad Daybell's property during the month of September 2019. His response was, I checked the visits by Alex Cox to Chad's house again. There were only four visits by Alex Cox during the month of September. These were on September 6th, September 9th, September 23rd, and September 25th. During the two visits on the 6th and 25th, all the pings were in and around the house and there were no pings anywhere in the backyard near the fire pit or pond. As you can see, these visits were also short, about 11 minutes and 17 minutes, like the one on September 23rd, which was 17 minutes. The visit on September 9th was the only long visit, approximately 2.5 hours. So two out of these four visits were one day after the kids were last seen. On June 9th, 2020, a search warrant was executed at Chad Daybell's residence and property with the assistance of the local FBI ERT team, we located at least multiple sites of interest. These sites were identified and corresponded to the cellular data of Alex Cox's phone when he was on the property mentioned in paragraphs 12 to 16. The first site of interest was located on the north side of the pond near the edge of the property. This site corresponded with the two GPS pings from Alex Cox's phone on September 23rd, 2019. A patch of ground was located that appeared to be disturbed. The disturbed area was approximately four feet feet by 2.5 feet. Members of the FBI ERT team removed the top layer of sod. Underneath the layer of sod were several large flat rocks. The rocks were removed and two pieces of flat paneling were found. The paneling was removed and investigators exposed a round object covered in black plastic. Upon exposing the round object covered in black plastic, a strong odor was noticed. An FBI ERT member used a small sharp instrument and made a small incision in the plastic and a layer of white plastic was observed. An incision was made into the layer of white plastic exposing what to appear to be human remains, the crown of a head covered in light brown hair. The remaining dirt around this object was methodically removed, exposing what appeared to be a body wrapped in black plastic. Cheryl Anderson, associate professor of anthropology at Boise State University, was present on the scene and advised the remains found near the pond appeared to be human. A second site of interest was located behind a red unattached outbuilding located roughly in the center of the property near a fire pit. Next to the fire pit is an area used as a pet cemetery. The site correlated to several GPS pings off of Alex Cox's phone on September 9th, 2019. Ground in this area was probed with steel pole and several areas of disturbed ground were located. Once the bricks were discovered, the soil was examined and what appeared to be two bones were located. Based on the condition of the bones, Cheryl Anderson was not able to determine whether the bones were human. Methodically, the dirt in this area was searched and several other items of interest were found, including other bones, charred tissue, and charred bones. Cheryl Anderson indicated these additional bones, both charred and uncharred, and tissue found were human remains. Investigators provided photos photos of some of the partial remains that were found at the pet cemetery to Sarah Getz, PhD, a forensic anthropologist. Dr. Getz was able to identify these remains as being non-adult human remains. So from everything we've gathered here, Alex Cox's phone pings were pretty much essential in terms of determining where the bodies would end up being. We don't have much more information about what happened to Tylee, but based on the fire in the, the bonfire situation and now charred and uncharred bones, we could maybe think that her corpse was burned. To end all of this, while officers were conducting their search, Chad Daybell was observed by officers to be continuously watching where officers were searching. Around the time the head mentioned in paragraphs 32 and 33 was discovered, Chad Daybell was observed leaving his daughter's residence in a gray SUV. I and other officers pursued him in police vehicles, conducted a traffic stop, and detained him due to the fact that human remains were discovered on his property. So I know we covered a lot here, and I think that for me, the most surprising thing was the extent of Alex Cox's involvement. And I never thought he wasn't involved at all. Like I knew that he had to be complicit in some way considering that he had shot Charles Vallow. And even the cir circumstances around that are suspicious, obviously like everything here. But the fact that he was so involved that his phone pings were essentially the map to find the remains was extremely surprising as I hadn't really seen much else in terms of his involvement. And I also wonder how much of this has to do with Lori Vallow in the sense of was she with there with him except that she just didn't bring her phone or was she telling him what to do? Like I wonder how much of this was in Lori's control versus how much she just told him like 
just deal with it. You know what I mean? And also with Chad, clearly since it was on his property, he can't be completely unrelated, obviously, especially since he was the one who came up with or told Lori about this idea of zombies. So now I guess I'm just wondering which of the moving parts might have had a bigger role or if they all had a similar role or how that is. You can let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you to my patrons as always, and I'll catch you guys next time.